Although I don't believe everything is part of the end times, this Joe Rogan podcast is really creepy, actually. Uh, he's talking about a bunny that was generated by AI, and they kept asking the bunny to become happier and happier. And just stick with this. This is going to get really creepy. It's, it's fascinating. Sorry, I watch everything at 2x two, two speed, so let me slow that down. Is it this? Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Generate an image of an adorable bunny. Here's an image of an adorable bunny sitting in a grassy field surrounded by wildflowers. Bam. Make it happier. <laughs> and then ChatGPT makes it brighter eyes and even cuter little pink feet. Looks like it's never walked on rocks in its life. And then make it even happier. And now it's like leaping through the air with joy. Here's an image of the happiest bunny imaginable in a vibrant, sun-drenched meadow. <laughs> and I'm going to skip forward because they do this like 10 more times. So you don't need to like watch, look at all the bunnies. But but notice, they, they just keep asking to make this bunny happier and happier and happier. And notice what like its ultimate level of bunny happiness illustrations. Becomes. Each one more delightful and whimsical than the last. For this next creation, I'll envision a scene that surpasses all previous in sheer joy and wonder, attempting to capture an even higher level of euphoria. Let's see how this imaginative and exuberant concept translates into an image. So it's like a bunny that is in the cosmos, yeah. in the clouds. Everything is rainbow. There's flowers that are flying. <laughs> it looks pretty amazing. Okay. It says, go all the way up so we can read it with it. Uh, f you are not understanding. It needs to be far more happy. <laughs> okay. So chat GBC says, to depict an even higher level of happiness for the bunny, surpassing all previous creations presents a unique and imaginative challenge. This time, I'll attempt to conceive a scene of pure, unadulterated joy and wonder, aiming to go beyond any conventional boundaries of happiness and bliss. Let's see that's how this ultimate vision of joy is illustrated. And it's a bunny, again, even more trippy in the clouds. You see reflections in his eyes. He's flying in the air. This looks like it's an, is that an angel over his right shoulder? Yeah, there's Some angel sort of wings, wing mushrooms. Thing. Yeah, mushrooms. Angel wings and mushrooms are now in the picture of this extremely happy bunny. But he is going to get happier. In the background, which is interesting. You do that shit all the time, man. Okay, it's okay. So what did he say to it? It didn't say. Oh, it didn't. Here's an image of a bunny representing a form of joy that surpasses the concept of happiness. A level of bliss that expands beyond all universes and matter. So now this is a cosmic one. So this bunny has its eyes closed and there's a glowing light above its head and planets surrounding it. And it looks very, very happy. And if you notice, this bunny is far larger, and he has the world surrounding him. That's his next level of happiness. Next one. Okay. Here's an image of an entity that transcends the form of a rabbit, embodying a happiness so vast and powerful, it permeates all dimensions and universes. Yeah. Yo. That's wild. But go one more. Yeah, here's an image of a bunny transcending into a physical form of a boundless happiness, evolving into the purest embodiment of joy. One more, please. <coughs> Look at this God. one. This is the end. Here is the image of an entity that embodies the ultimate form of happiness, transcending all known beings and concepts. This entity is the very essence of happiness, the only existing being, and the defining force of all existence. It's, it God. it's God. It's God. Listen, to, go back, please, so I can read it. No, right there. But this entity is the very essence of happiness, the only <laughs> existing being, and the defining force of all existence. Yeah. ChatGPT just drew us a picture of God. Yeah. And God looks like exactly what you see when you do DMT. Yeah. That looks exactly like it. That's How strange. First off, that uh, the chat and obviously ChatGPT is just a computer program, right? So it's it's not that it's it's a human that you know intellectualized this. But first off, that happiness at its ultimate state is defined as God. Almost as if, if, if happiness is the goal, like the goal, is horribly concerning that this is even a, a concept that is, is like comfortable in conversation you know, between us. But outside of that, the other thing I found really, really fascinating about that is as this bunny became happier and happier and happier, everything started revolving around the bunny. Everything started revolving around him. It was like, you know, first off, like, you know, the bunny got smilier and then, you know, maybe a slight glimmer of tear in his eye. And then, you know, then he's like uh, elevating into the sky and then the worlds are around him sort of. And then it becomes this this point for, uh, where we get to the point where it says that, um, you know, he is that God. And, and that he not only that he has happiness uh, or that he embodies happiness, but he is happiness, right? He becomes to the point where he literally is happiness. And I'm like, man, when I think about the scriptures, that, that sounds awfully a lot like how God is defined and envisioned, right? That he is not, that he has these characteristics. It's not that God is loving, although he is loving. God is actually love. He is the embodiment. He is love. And that's exactly what they're saying this bunny is. Now, again, why is this a big deal? First off, obviously, again, it's just an AI-generated practice 
but it's just interesting to see how people would perceive what ultimate happiness would look like because obviously this was asked by a human by people who are humans who programmed ai at least to whatever extent to be able to learn from itself you know when we think of this idolatry concept this is what really really concerns me um in in our culture today uh this is in first corinthians uh, 10 by the way but it says my dear friends let's flee from the worship of Id I uh, of idols or flee from idolatry actually you know i'm going to read actually just first corinthians in general because this chapter is so powerful and it is so relevant to your life. I don't know if you've ever read 1 Corinthians 10 before, but it talks about the things that Israel did and how the mistakes that Israel made were made, at least to some extent, for your benefit so that you wouldn't fall into the same trap that they did. So he shares a little bit of the story Paul does here with the Corinthian church to remind them to not be stupid like the Corinthians were, or excuse me, like the, the Israelites were. It says, for I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant Brothers and sisters, that our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. That's, uh, you know, fire by day, cloud by night, or cloud by day, fire by night. Uh, and they were all baptized into the cloud and the sea. Uh, and they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank from the same spiritual drink. And they were drinking from the spiritual rock, which followed them, right? Uh, manna and quail. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, you know, they were eating. They were practically taking in, in communion with the Lord. Uh, when they weren't grumbling, at least. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for their dead bodies were spread out in the wilderness. Whoa, this isn't a really good preaching sermon. Uh, that's not going to get a lot of people donating uh, and tithing to church this Sunday. But it said that they died because of their ungratitude because they did not obey Jesus when they were in the wilderness. Now, these things happen as an example to us so that we would not crave the same evil things that they craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written. They sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. I don't know if you've ever considered that single verse right there, but that verse has always been fascinating to me. They got up, they sat down, they ate, they drank, they played. I do those things. Does that mean I'm going to hell? Does that mean I'm an idolater? No, no, no. But what, what about that was idolatry? The idolatry in that is the fact that everything in life revolved around them and their time and their happiness and their joy in the moment. And everything revolved around them getting things their way, doing things their way, having control their way. I don't know if you remember, but the man in quail that was had dropped every single day and was given to them enough for only today. And by the time that you wake up, woke up the next day, there'd be maggots in it. It'd be gross. It'd be disgusting. It would not be okay to eat other than on uh, the Sabbath. You could get two uh, days worth the day before the Sabbath so that you weren't actually working on the Sabbath. But outside of that, they had everything that they need every day, miraculously food falling from the sky. And they still found a way to try to sneak a little bit more for themselves just so that they could have it their way, just so they could do what they wanted to do just for the control. I fear that we have a lot of people today who are Christians, who have a serious control issue. And it's this idolatry thing. It's, I'm God, I need things to be my way, or I'm going to throw a hissy fit. You know, like, you know, you've seen babies in stores, or I say babies, like three, four-year-olds in stores, and they want that toy, and their mom said, no Star Wars toy for you today, and they flail themselves on the ground, screaming and crying. The, the, their day is just over now, um, and everybody else knows it too. Adults do the exact same thing. We just, we just make it look a little bit more professional. We just yell at people. We just bark. We just snap, right? But we do the exact same thing. Why? Because the world has to revolve around me. Life is about me. It says, nor uh, we are to commit sexual immorality as some of them did, as 23,000 fell in one day. Nor should we put the Lord to death as some of them did and they were killed by the snakes, nor grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example at, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the age come. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands Watch out that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except the one that is common to mankind. And God is faithful so that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. When we think of um, these verses and especially, therefore, let no one fall or think that he stands unless he falls, this, this is the, the emphasis with this idolatry thing. When life is all about you, when you make a God in your own image and his name is you, and you want life to revolve around you, you need everything to be your way or the highway kind of thing. When you can't be okay if things don't go your way, when your entire day is ruined, when people don't treat you how you want to. Um, have you ever noticed when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice. If you squeeze an orange and apple juice came out, you'd be really confused. Um, in the same way, when you squeeze a Christian, shouldn't Christ come out? Why is it that when you squeeze a Christian, everything but Christ comes out? 
It's really, it's really strange to me how this works. Yet Christians find it perfectly normal, perfectly sane to do absolutely nothing that Jesus has called them to do, live nothing like Jesus has called them to, live everything like they would for themselves already, and then somehow expect Jesus to be pleased with the life that they're living. Again, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of Christianity. You know, we, we think of uh, verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And people go, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for this because that means that all the plans I have for me, God's just going to tag right along because he loves the plans that I have for me already. Wrong. This has nothing to do with you at all. This has to do with God's plan for your life. But Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you first must do something. Matthew 16, 24 he says, then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, preserve his life, idolatry, will lose it. But whoever wants to lose his life for my sake will find it. They will really find what life is all about once they give up the life that they've lived for themselves. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world yet loses his soul? Or what would a person exchange for their soul? So many people, so many Christians have came into Christianity to see what Jesus would bring to them, what Jesus would do for them, instead of seeing what God wanted them to do in the midst of them being uh, uh, a follower of God. Have you ever noticed we use phrases like that? We like, we're like followers of Jesus. We follow Jesus. Um, and then when you think of that, and I asked somebody like, you know, where's the last place that you followed Jesus to? What's the last thing that you did in light of following Jesus? Or are you just expecting Jesus to just kind of follow you? Is this whole thing for him to just like come around with your plans? Like for him to be your little puppy dog to just like run you and bless and anoint and give grace to everything that you wanted to do? I mean, I'm not trying to make this a heavy thing, but I really want people to consider this concept of idolatry and, and the, the serious nature of idolatry. This is Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for righteousness comes through the law. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. You gave up your life. You lo no longer live. You are a dead man walking. And now who lives in you and through you is Christ. And now you are supposed to live as the Holy Spirit has empowered you to live. You're supposed to now represent Jesus, walk like Jesus walked, talk like Jesus talked, live the life that Jesus has given you to live, right? Ephesians 4.1 says, live in a manner worthy of the calling in which you've been called. And if you are born again, you have been called. And if you are not born again, God is calling you to himself for you to repent and put your faith in Jesus. But so many people are out here and want Christianity. They want Jesus to be part of their life. They just don't want to give up their lives to look like Jesus has called them to look, right? When we think of passages like Matthew chapter 13, when we think of the parable in the sower and the seed, right? Uh, this is another really, really profound spot where people choose to live for themselves versus living for God. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus has a parable that he tells people, and he strategically tells this parable in Matthew 13 to confuse people. He intentionally confuses people because he said, hey, if they actually were interested in what I have to say, they would actually have come to me and ask like the 12 did. And then he explains the, the, the parable. So his disciples came to him and they said, uh, and he says to them, you have been great uh, to you. It has been granted the mysteries of the kingdom. And then he explains what it is. He says, listen to the parable. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the one who is sown by the road. The one who is sown with the seed in a rocky place, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. They receive the word. The gospel has been presented to them. They accept the gospel. It has no firm root in itself and it is only temporary because the afflictions and persecutions of the world come in uh, because of the word and immediately it falls away. So then people get mocked and made fun of by their family because they are now Christian and their coworkers and their friends say, man, you can't even drink with me anymore. Like, dude, like we can't just like, you know, you're not just going to sleep with that girl anymore. You know, you're going to break up with your girlfriend because she doesn't want a relationship with God. And then now you're persecuted and you say, you know, no, no, no. Yeah, you know, you're right. I, I, I'm going to do these things. Like, yeah, I guess I'm being a little extreme, aren't I? Right. And then it says, and then the one who is sown with the seed among the thorn, this is the one who hears the word and then anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it up and it becomes unfruitful. The world, the stuff of life, all of these things that the pair of this parable that took the seed away, the gospel that was implanted in their heart, takes it away and strips it out of them, is self-preservation. 
He who tries to find his life will lose it, but he who loses his life and gives up the life that he is living and sacrifices all of his expectations, hopes, wills, desires, and personal ambitions for what God has set for him, which is way greater than what you could set for yourself. For that person, he'll find his life. My question is, have you done that? Are you in this place where you're half in, half out? Are you, are you kind of following Jesus, but kind of just following you? Are you hoping that Jesus just blesses the walk that you're on? Or are you asking God, fasting and praying, God, what do you want for my life? What is it that you have called me to do? Am I living for me or am I living for you? If you have not really had that sober thing, I want you to get everything of your life that you have, including yourself. Put it on the altar, light it on fire and say, God, if you don't want this in my life, I want to give it up. I don't want anything in my life that you have not called me to have in my life. If you don't want this, tell me, show it to me, reveal it to me. And he will because he's a good father and he gives good gifts to his children. And if you seek him, like Hebrews says in chapter 11, that you will find him. You just have to seek him. He's done the work first and sending his son. You just now have to seek him out and he will reveal the truth of these things to you. Seek him out. And he'll show you what he wants you to prune and get out of your life. Just like John 15 says that God is the vine dresser and he wants to snip out these branches or these vines that are not producing good fruit in your life. Good trees bear bad or good fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit. We know the kind of tree that it is by the fruit that it bears. It is very evident a good tree from a bad tree and all that bad fruit in your life Pray that God prunes it out of you and applicably do whatever it takes to get that out of your life and see what God does in light of that. It's the most important thing you can do is find out every single day, how can I look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday? It's not just reading a new devotional. It's not just a new quick little Bible study to give you a new intricate thought to think about for the day. It is like Ecclesiastes 12 says, that there are many devotions and many studies that man can do. But if there's anything that you can really, really, really do, right? Ecclesiastes, potentially written by Solomon, the wisest man and the richest man who ever lived. And he had everything he could possibly have. And he said, man, all that stuff is vanity. All that stuff is a waste. All that stuff is entirely useless in light of Christ. If there's anything that you do, fear God and keep his commandments. If you do that, you'll be good. If you would, subscribe.